industry inside a nutshell. The show where we sail into our port of call discussing maritime history. So in this video, we have two newcomers I wanted to introduce before we start the video. And these two newcomers have played a very special role, especially during Britannic months, as they have pulled up a few surprises. And oh boy, let me tell you, they are the best surprises ever. So first of all, I want to give a huge thank you and mention to Leo for narrating the video. And I also want to give a last but huge thank you to Paul for composing an original score. I, I, I have no words to describe how beautiful this instrumental piece is and I think he did a massive big job there. Paul, once again, thank you. And also, keep in mind, Paul has actually redone the music for the intro for the channel. Now, I can't give away of when it's going to be, but with the new music, there will be a new outro but I am considering it to be pushing it to either December or the new year but I'm not giving anything away just yet so that is a big huge surprise and <laughs> I know the intro was a bit of a long one but I knew that there was going to be loads and loads of new people to actually share and explain their stories so I, I think it was pretty well done to say the least. <laughs> Do not, try not to be a bit too big headed. But anyway, I hope you guys will enjoy this video and you are in for a real treat. And if you want to check out Paul's Spotify account, I will leave a link to it in the description box down below. And until then, I hope you enjoy the story of the Britannic's rumoured name. On the 26th of February, 1914, the HMHS Britannic was slid into the waters of Belfast Lock before she was to be towed to the Thompson Dry Dock, which is where she was to be fitted and ready for passenger service either later that year or the next year after that. All of this would be delayed when Britain declared war on Germany, sparking the beginning of the First World War. However, even before her launch, the Britannic would become the center of speculation and rumor, especially when it came to her name. For over a century, it was rumored that the Britannic had her name changed from another Greek mythological word. The Gigantic This rumor has been played out around the Harland and Wolf shipyard and into the 21st century where it was even featured in some Titanic documentaries. Some of them had ended up in different parts of the world, too. In one example, a rumor from Mexico suggests that the White Star Line changed the name from Gigantic to Britannic because the shipbuilders didn't want God to sink her. That was in the wake of the Titanic disaster, of course. But is all of this actually true? In this video, we are going to do a deep dive into the topic and sink it once and for all. The origin of the name Gigantic began in the infamous book that predicted the Titanic disaster. This book was called Futility, otherwise known as The Wreck of the Titan, written by the author Morgan Robertson. Although the story centers on the fictional ship, the SS Titan, Robertson briefly mentions the Titan's youngest sister, the Gigantic. However, this name was actually mentioned twice in the novel, as Robertson wrote the word Gigantic once again to describe the size and length of the iceberg that the Titan had hit during her maiden voyage in the North Atlantic. From 1903 to 1904, construction began on the arrow gantries that were built at the North Yard. This was on the waters of the Victoria Channel in Belfast Lock near the Harland and Wolf shipping offices. These gantries would become a series of slipways which would build the new set of liners, known as the Olympic Class. The class of liners were to be constructed by Chief Designer Alexander Carlisle, the head of the Department of Design, Thomas Andrews Jr., and his assistant Edward Wilding. The men had the idea to construct the liners to rival the Cunard Line, who had constructed their superliners. 
To do that, they needed to spy on the Cunard's four-funnel ship, the Lusitania. It is believed that Edward Wilding made two visits to the John Brown shipyard in Clydebank to observe the vessel during her construction process in either 1905 or 1906. Wilding would also travel on the Lusitania's sixth voyage in 1908, and he made notes to take back to Harlan and Wolf. Sounds like espionage, honestly. But we're not here to talk about that. While preparations for the Olympic, Titanic, and Britannic were pending, workers were wondering why the builders chose the names of the ship. At the time, all three sisters were named Halls 400, 401, and 433. When it came down to choosing their names, it was decided that these new liners would be named after 12 gods from Greek mythology. From 1908 to 1910, the two older sister ships, 400 and 401, would be called the Olympic and the Titanic. As curiosity grew for the name of Hall 433, unauthorized publications such as posters and articles about the three liners began to circulate. Various posters would advertise a third ship as gigantic. However, some of them were vague and they weren't pieces of official White Star Line publicity or the Harland and Wolf shipyard. According to Simon Mills, who owns the wreck of the Britannic, there is no existing document at the Public Record Officer of North Ireland that presents evidence of any kind of name change, even as early as six months before the sinking of Titanic. In addition to this, Hall Number 433 wasn't named until the 1st of September 1912. The reason could be the observations of shipbuilders uh, wanted to see how well the RMS Olympic was received, especially during her maiden voyage in June of 1911. From observations and feedback notes from the Harland Wolf shipbuilder, Thomas Andrews Jr., these would become the foundations to make changes to the third sister ship. On the 30th of November, 1911, work had begun on Hall 433 on slipway number 2, which is the exact same slipway where RMS Olympic was actually built. By the 12th of March, 1912, the Britannic's keel was framed to the height of the double bottom and the ship, but when Titanic sank one month later, and in response, Edward Wilding, now the chief shipbuilder following the death of Thomas Andrews Jr., observed and likely made changes to the Britannic to make her safer while following the new British Broad of Trades regulations that would change in the aftermath of the British Inquiry. The ship had a fully framed uh, to the height of the double bottom. When she was adjusted, the Britannic had a new inner skin fitted, reduced the size of the middle boiler in boiler room number 5, and additional regular and collapsible lifeboats, taking a total number of 55 now. She also had five gantries, six Wellen, and two Wellen davits on the poop deck. A new bulkhead in the electric engine room, five bulkheads extending from E deck to B deck, and an increasing number of watertight compartments. The Britannic was launched in 1914, and as we all know, she would sadly be sunk on the 21st of November 1916 after she struck a mine, laid by the German submersible U number 73. In conclusion, while Britannic was a gigantic ship, the name Gigantic wasn't actually ever planned for her. It is impossible to suggest that the name Gigantic was even put forward by the shipbuilders or spread by the shipbuilders. If it did, the shipbuilders or the ship designers would have made this rumor deliberately or on purpose, as someone could have suggested that name in the Harlan Wolf office drawing room, or someone read Margaret Robertson's book before passing the rumor around, which is more likely. We may never truly know the reasoning behind the gigantic rumor, but uh, with this video, hopefully we will put it to rest once and for all. If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.